problems? And repeat after me. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. Keeping the palms joined. Palms down. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you for being here. You know, I'm going to, at least at the beginning, I think what's hitting me right now is probably going to be similar to what I said on Saturday morning. So uh, if you were here Saturday or um, you were one of our millions of YouTube followers um, on Saturday, then I'm going to, uh, I'm glad that Vicki actually knew that was funny. Um, <laughs> Then I'm going to, I think, repeat a little bit about what I said on Saturday morning when we started. Uh, you know, it's been 16 months uh, since we've had people in this space. Uh, yesterday was uh, 16 months to the day since we put the sign up to closed. And in that period of time from then until now, uh, over 4 million people uh, died from COVID-19. And so there's kind of been... This, you know, of course, we're thrilled to be here, um, grateful to, to open. Um, but to me, it's not a celebration. It's not a grand anything. It's an incredible opportunity to just sit in gratitude for the fact that I'm alive, that you're alive. And there are four million people um, and more, I'm sure, uh, that are not because of the pandemic and what we have faced and continue to face on a daily basis around the world. Um, so as we were you know, putting together this concept of how were we going to host classes and you know, in person and you know, via Zoom or YouTube or all that kind of stuff, all that we kept coming back to is what can we do that is the most uh, heartfelt way to open but also keep in mind the heaviness of what we're going through and continue to go through. Uh, this has been an incredibly traumatic experience for um, globally, for you know, locally, our own immediate community, people I know that have lost loved ones and family and friends and you know, are sitting with that heaviness right now. Uh, so this has been a really challenging time. And you know, Buddhist practice is really about waking up to present moment. And again, for me, uh, it's simply gratitude to just be here, to be in a situation where I'm alive and we can open these doors and we can have, you know, Maggie and Travis here and holding this temple down. And we can have all of you sitting here because, you know, that means you also uh, are, are alive. And uh, I, I hope that with all the challenges and difficulties that you're facing in your life, um, you know, keep in mind a couple things. One, uh, 16 months ago and then some, this temple was filled with people prior to a pandemic. 
meaning the daily stresses and pressures and anger and sadness and anxiety and depression that you deal with didn't just occur for the most part in the last 16 months. You just got tested on a level that you probably maybe never knew you had to, to face or differently than what you would ever anticipated. And so please also uh, hopefully recognize that you've gone through a lot and you're going to continue to go through a lot. Um, not just due to what we've experienced the last 16 months, but hopefully you can have and settle in some gratitude uh, for yourself and appreciation uh, and a little bit of kind of love and care uh, for yourself for making it, you know, through to this, this point. Um, so I really, you know, I'm, I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful to everyone that's held this community together, um, you know, virtually for the last 16 months and, and uh, everyone that has done whatever they could to make sure, you know, this community is still here. So uh, I'm glad to be here, obviously. And, uh, you know, as we fumble through what it looks like to, to reopen a Dharma Bum Temple, there's no manual for, you know, how do you open post a pandemic and not even post, but in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, so, you know, I've been joking, but those who know me well enough know that, you know, my jokes have real undertone seriousness to them. So, you know, as all the, um, you know, the, the discomforts or the, you know, how come the temple doors aren't open at two in the afternoon or how come, you know, we have to wear masks when we come in or how come the, you know, how come the hours are, are what they are. Let's just appreciate that we're here at all and everything else will take care of itself. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's what I kind of want to um, just share as we start. Um, and again, just a tremendous thank you to, to everybody that's um, kept us here. So uh, with that, um, we'll do some meditation. Uh, for those who are maybe brand new or never sat here with me before, uh, there's a couple things to tell you before we begin. Um, nothing's going to happen to you. Right, you're not going to float away. Uh, you won't have any mystical, magical, <laughs> magical experiences. Uh, you're not going to figure anything out whatsoever. Uh, the mind that races all day long is not going to shut off. Don't judge your practice. I mean, you don't ask yourself, is this working or not working? Am I doing it right or wrong? Uh, we're just going to sit and breathe. You'll hear sounds inside, sounds outside. This is life. Life is filled with chaos. And the practice of meditation is learning to get quiet and still within all the chaos. So posture, you just want to be comfortable. If you're on the cushions, often it helps slide into the front third, pushing the stomach forward, allows the back to straighten, shoulders are relaxed, hands can be on the knees or in the lap, whatever's comfortable. If you're on the benches or chairs, also just trying to sit up straight, relaxing the shoulders, hands are on the knees or lap. If you need to move, simply move. Movement doesn't make you a bad meditator, it just means you have an itch or your leg hurts. I will guide us as we begin. We'll settle into a little bit of silence. And again, most important, don't expect anything. And starting with the eyes closed, if comfortable, or slightly open. Mouth open or closed. We'll start with taking three deep breaths, slowly. Settle into a natural rhythm of the breath. No 
Noticing the mind as it wanders, jumping from thought to thought. Start with gently guiding the attention, focus to the stomach or chest. Breathing in, feel them rise. Breathing out, they fall. Simply continue this practice, observing sensation of breath. As the mind wanders, lost in thought, recognize it, release that thought, return attention, focus to the breath.
Where's your mind? Return attention, focus to the breath. Letting go of expectations. Letting go of judgment from the practice. Just sitting, breathing.
Learning to be comfortable in stillness, in quiet. Just sitting, breathing. Keeping the mind alert, aware of each sound, each thought. physical sensation. Yet concerned with nothing but sitting, breathing. Body still rested, and the speech quiet, aware of all sounds, and the mind learning to settle. Know what it's like to just sit and breathe. Knowing with each breath, there's nothing else to do. Nowhere else to go. No one else to be. Everything beautiful, exactly as it is. Sitting, breathing. Once again, taking three deep breaths slowly. Thank you. 
slowly open the eyes. Slowly begin to move. Most important, the practice of meditation is to recognize how you feel now, immediately after. Compare this to how you typically feel throughout your day. Recognize the difference, if there is one. Ask yourselves how you prefer to feel every day for the rest of your life. And realize every you feel now, if it's quiet, calm, and still, or a busy mind, racing mind, whatever you're sitting with at this moment, has nothing to do with anything I said. It's not from how we sit and hold the hands across the legs. It's not from the sounds around us or anything else for that matter. It's everything to do with your own mind and your own mind's reaction to an external condition. This is what the Buddha called Pratitya Samupata, means dependent origination. This is the basis of the Buddha's awakening. The word Buddha simply means awakened. He was a human being no different than any one of us began to understand why he suffered, why he got angry, sad, depressed, stressed, anxious. He began to understand the causal relationship of all phenomena. And what that means very simply for all of us, regardless of where you come from or what you believe in and where you think you're going, your whole life is filled with things that happen and you react. More stuff happens, more reactions. That's it. That's what we get every day. This practice is learning what it's like to respond to something quietly, peacefully, still. Because for most of us, the way you responded to the last 20 minutes is quite different from how you respond to everything else that's happening throughout your day. And so all we're working on is closing the gap where the way you feel now is closer to how you feel always. Just a driven, motivated, productive, successful, whatever that means to you in you, your respective lives. But with a mind that's steady, clear, focused, distracted by nothing, disturbed by no one. This practice is not easy. It's not necessarily fun, but it's free. Meditation is free, but this practice is free. It's sitting, breathing. Becoming aware of what you think, what you say, and what you do every moment. Meditation is not an escape. Buddhist practice is not an escape, as often people think it is. Especially if you're new. If you're brand new to meditation or Buddhist practice, this common idea that your life is a mess and then you're going to do meditation and escape to your little quiet place. Well, that's great except you're going to spend your whole life trying to escape to something. And that's not at all what the Buddha taught. What he taught was waking up to the present moment. And sometimes that present moment sucks. Sometimes that present moment is incredibly painful. Sometimes that present moment is incredibly traumatic. It's difficult. And this practice is learning to be with things as they are, not running or escaping from anything or to anything. Once we stop trying to change, fix, control, manipulate everything around us, which is where we spend so much of our time hoping they do this, hoping they do that, wishing people would do this, wishing they would do that, why did they do this, why did they do that? We spend so much time judging, critiquing what everybody else is doing. And this practice is waking up to what are you doing? What are your thoughts? What are your words? What are your actions? And that's kind of why Buddhist practice is incredibly difficult. Because you know what you can't do? Well, you can do anything you want, but the teaching is to stop blaming others for your mess. Did you two come together? I hate masks because you can't even see smiles. 
Did you two come together? You looked immediately at each other. Are you married? Well, not yet. Not yet, but close enough. I mean, you're together, yeah. It's funny, because even without, I've just been doing this long enough. Yeah, sorry to pick on you. I just saw that right when it happened. I thought it was great, right? We want to blame others, you know? And if you're in a relationship, oh, it's always their fault, you know? And, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, that doesn't mean that that other person doesn't often do things they shouldn't do. But what that means is both parties, all of us included, you know, um, we often want to turn to the other person, whether we know them intimately in a relationship or whether they're absolute strangers and everywhere in between. You know, we often want to point the finger and blame others. And that doesn't excuse other people's actions. Okay. But what it means is we have an opportunity every day to challenge ourselves to be kind and compassionate and loving and caring and forgiving to everyone we interact with. And we take that ownership on ourselves. You already know people are going to spend the rest of their life doing things that you don't like. I mean, if you haven't figured that out by now, then you're missing something. That's, that's the reality. People will spend... You will spend your life observing and critiquing and judging other things that people do that you don't like. So the question is, what can we do in response to what we observe? That's what we can control. But we're often triggered very easily. So the question is, how do we respond? And this, for me, is a lot of what Buddhist practice is about. Again, it's not escaping. It's waking up to what are challenges, you know, in relationships with colleagues, with friends, with strangers. What are the challenges that we're dealing with? What are the difficulties we're dealing with? But look at them honestly and then start to ask yourself, what role do I play in this? Am I coming from a place filled with loving kindness and compassion and joy and equanimity? Am I coming into this with this mindset of generosity and morality and patience? Am I working hard? Am I being diligent? Always coming back on, for me, one of the greatest things was learning that Buddhist practice was just a mirror. And when you look in the mirror, there you are. You are stuck. And the good news is to well, one of my favorite teachers, Shinra Suzuki, the Zen Mind Beginner Mind, uh, he taught that uh, to his students, he would say, you're all perfect exactly how you are. And you all could use a little improvement. <laughs> it's still one of my favorite teachings I ever read because it was just a reminder that like, hey, you know, anyone here have been hard on themselves at all the last mm -hmm. five years of your life beating yourself up like everything's your fault and you're such a terrible person and no one's gonna love me and I'm so bad right you are perfect exactly how you are so you've been free from all of those you know worries and you just need a little improvement but something tells me especially from that laughter that there's often this view that we have this massive amount of improvement and then what we do is then we just critique ourselves and we lack love and care and compassion and kindness for ourselves. We never think we're good enough and everything we're doing is wrong. And, you know, kindness and compassion must start with yourself first. And then that goes into the world. And very often in not just places like this, but especially places like this, you see a lot of people that love and care and are so good at taking care of other people. Right? Temples and meditation places and all that kind of spiritual stuff tend to be filled with people that are so loving and kind to everybody else. And then you say, well, how do you treat yourself? And the answer is very different. So a little improvement. Recognize where we're greedy or angry or ignorant. And work on that. But be patient as you work on it. Because if you've been, if you've been angry for 20 years of your life, for example... It's going to take more than two weeks <laughs> to get through that. This is a lifelong practice. And for me as a practitioner, that's what Buddhism is. 
It's been 18 years of a daily practice of recognizing how greedy am I, how angry am I, how ignorant am I? With also a little pat on the back that says, you're doing okay. So with that, I'll pause. Um, I always prefer to just open up to questions. Um, meditation, Buddhist practice, anything you're sitting with. Um, I can ramble on lots of stuff, and I'd rather ramble on uh, a question that sits in your mind. So, um, yeah. Um, what are the Four Noble Truths? The Four Noble Truths. So the very first thing the Buddha taught, and just to back up a little bit, um, this is, for those who may be brand new, this is 2,500 years ago in India, so 500 years before Christ. He was a prince. He lived a wealthy life. He had all the wealth, all the riches, all the women, all the everything you can imagine. And then at 29 years old, he left home. He roamed the base of the Himalayan mountains for six years. And at 35, he sat down and said, I'm not moving from under this Bodhi tree until I figure out why I suffer. So he did that, sat down. 21 days, he had what's called the awakening. It's where they called him the Buddha. As I said earlier, the word Buddha just means awakened. And he then began to teach. This is at 35 years old. He taught for 45 years. He died when he was 80. Now, the very first thing he taught, the question for those who didn't hear it, was what are the Four Noble Truths? So the very first thing he taught were the Four Noble Truths. And what happened was there's actually on the wall up there behind the, uh, which I always think is funny, and it wasn't by design, but right above the exit sign, uh, is the actually the very first piece we ever bought uh, for the Dharma Bum Temple when we were downtown uh, 14 years ago. Uh, that is him teaching the Four Noble Truths in what's called the Dharma Chakra Mudra, where I think in that he's sitting like this, but if not, he holds a mudra, it's called the first turning of the Dharma wheel, which is what the Four Noble Truths are called. And the five disciples that are sitting there, those were the first five guys that he was kind of traveling with, and then he left all of them. And then they came back and they said, there's Siddhartha. He looks like he's figured something out. Let's go sit with him. So they sat down and he gave the discourse, the first turning of the Dharma wheel, where he taught the Four Noble Truths. And the first thing he said is life is dukkha. Translates to suffering in English. A, I think a very terrible translation of the word suffering because suffering sounds so heavy, you know? Um, but... Who here hates mayonnaise? I saw your hand, a couple hands back there. So you hate mayonnaise, right? Yes. So when you go to a deli, sorry, what, what's your name? Brittany. Brittany. So when you go to a deli and you order a sandwich, what do you tell them? Uh, no mayonnaise. No mayonnaise. <laughs> and then sure enough, you got your sandwich, you're totally stoked, you're ready to eat, and there's mayonnaise. How do you feel? Pretty disappointed. Pretty disappointed. That is dukkha. That is suffering. It doesn't mean unless you're allergic to mayonnaise that your life is over. But you're in discomfort, you're angst, dissatisfaction. This is what dukkha is. So it's simple things like getting mayonnaise on a sandwich when you don't want it. And it's, you know, deep, heavy, traumatic suffering and loss, loss of loved ones, right? So heavy suffering and light suffering. But we experience dukkha every day of our lives. It's too hot. It's too cold. I don't like this shirt. I don't like what they're saying. I don't like this TV show. You know, I mean, you, you have gone through so much dukkha today, it's amazing you're even alive. <laughs> right? So the Buddha said, the first thing is, you're guaranteed to suffer. As soon as you're born, you're going to suffer your whole life. Now, a friend of mine years ago said that the first time he encountered Buddhism in college, like 25, 30 years ago, he opened up a book, and the first thing he read was, life is suffering. And he closed it and said, well, that sucks. I'm not interested in Buddhism. Man. How depressing is that? But the second noble truth, he never turned the page, right? The second noble truth is what's the cause of suffering? And the Buddha said the cause of suffering is greed, anger, ignorance. This is known as the three poisons, right? We're constantly greedy. We want more. Whatever we have, it's never enough. I mean, just look at your life. And it's not about how much or how little you have, but very rarely is whatever we have enough. We need more shirts and more shoes and new iPhone numbers and we need a better look at mask. I mean, we're, we need more. We constantly want more. So we're greedy. That causes suffering. We're angry. It's the second cause of suffering. We just don't like the way things are and we get angry at people. Anyone get angry at anyone today? Right? 
No, really? Nobody? A few of you? Thank you for the honesty. No lying is also one of the practices, so the rest of you are in trouble. Uh, so no greed, no anger, or anger, greed, and ignorance is the third one, right? That we're ignoring the truth. So there's reality, and then there's our perception of it. And we often see things very differently from how they actually are. So this is the cause of our suffering, greed, anger, ignorance. The practice to overcome greed is generosity. The practice to overcome anger is compassion. And the practice to overcome ignorance is wisdom. So you practice the second noble truth, the cause of suffering, by practicing generosity, compassion, and wisdom. Third noble truth is the ending of suffering. That's the good news, yay. Chapter three, you get out of suffering. This is nirvana, liberation, freedom from suffering. But for me as a practitioner, I like to look at it as, can I suffer less today than I did yesterday? Right, open up a book and it's like, Buddhism is about nirvana. And then you're gonna spend your whole life trying to figure out how to get to nirvana. You're craving, you're desiring to get somewhere. The practice of ending suffering, I don't suggest you wake up and think, can I end suffering today? Because you're going to be really frustrated at the end of the day, right? You will suffer because you're trying to end your suffering. Just work on the practice of suffering less each day, right? Third noble truth, ending of suffering. And the fourth one is the path. The Buddha taught very clearly the eightfold path. This is having a, think of it as a roadmap. So the beautiful thing about Buddhism is all you have to do is like eight things. That's it. Simple, all right? So by the end of tonight, you could all be like fully awakened. Don't take this personally, you probably won't be, but you could be, right? The practice of the Eightfold Path is to start with having the correct views, thoughts, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. Correct views, thoughts, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, and concentration. All of that, the Four Noble Truths, Eightfold Path, it's on Google, it's free, you don't need like 400 pages on it, it is so simple, like, you'll, you'll hear it, if you read 100 descriptions of it, you'll read it 100 different ways, but they're all basically talking about the same thing. And then, the hard part is, doing it, right? For me, my first teacher, she always said, think good thoughts, speak good words, do good deeds, right? So good, you could even put it on a t-shirt. Think good thoughts, right? <laughs> Speak good words, do good deeds. That's it. If you do those three things, that is the Eightfold Path in practice, right? What are we thinking about? Are our thoughts greedy? Are they angry? Are they ignorant? Are my thoughts all about me, you know? Next time you get into an argument, I mean, the night's still young. It might even happen tonight. Ask yourself, am I thinking about me or am I thinking about the other person? Right? So what are our views? Are my words kind and gentle and honest and true? And then your action, how do you live your life? Throughout? How do you go through your day? Are you harming self and others? Are you gentle towards self and others? What this is really talking about is your karma. The word karma means action. Karma is not what goes around, comes around. Karma is not getting what you deserve. Karma is not what they did bad, so they're going to get bad. Because we all know it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Right? Y'all look at someone and they think, well, they're bad, so bad's gonna happen, and then they get something great. And then you've done something good, right? And bad stuff happens. Karma is not what you get, it's what you give. Karma, again, the word means action. What do we put into our lives? What do we say, what do we think, what do we do? So don't think of karma as a thing that's coming back to you. Think of karma as, you know, a cue ball that hits the all the, the balls on the table. Cue ball hits the rack and every ball goes into a different direction. Your whole life you are that cue ball. And every person, place, and thing you interact with, you leave an impact. So as you interact, do it with kind thoughts, kind words, kind actions. So does that help with the Four Noble Truths? Yeah. Like I said, in theory, that makes sense. And now it's like the rest of our life we get to practice it. Yeah, in the back, and then go ahead. Um, for the second noble truth and the part about ignorance, yeah. and the, the uh, I guess the antidote would be wisdom. The, how do you acquire wisdom without being ignorant? That's a great question. That's the exact same, this is really funny. That's the exact same question that Tom 
sitting in the back of Dre and Mom on Saturday morning. We're sitting, Dre, raise your hand, and Mom, raise your hand. So Tom and Dama, we're I'm only picking on them. They're not in the room right now, so I'm talking about them, you know, just in front of our millions of YouTube followers. But they're married, been together 25 years. They have a little five-year-old child there. And he asked the, almost the exact same question. How do you ultimately practice wisdom, right? And my response was to Tom, I could play this out on YouTube, but I'll just use them as an example. Tom said, I asked Tom, do you know when you're being ignorant? And you know what Dama did? She laughed. <laughs> right? Do you know when you're being ignorant? She's laughing. <laughs> do you know when you do things that are ignorant? Uh, yes. Yes. Could you make a list of 10 things you do that are probably not so kind or ignorant? Problem. Well, let's just call it eight. You know, I don't want to pick on you too bad, right? So look at this list of eight things that are ignorant. And again, it's not about thinking you're a terrible person or beating yourself up. It's just being honest. Like, yeah, I'm greedy. Yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I'm selfish. You know, be honest about those things and say, okay, these eight things, these are ignorant. This is life all about me. And then the question you're asking is, well, what's wisdom? Well, if you do those eight things less, that's pretty wise. So instead of looking for what is this ultimate definition, because that's really what everybody, you know, not everyone, but that's often what people ask. How do you know what wisdom is? And the reason for me that I explain it this way is I pull this from the Buddhist teachings where uh, Sabuti, one of his disciples, he asked Sabuti to give a discourse on emptiness. Right? Emptiness is basically the wisdom teachings. Prajnaparamita means perfection of wisdom. These are what are called, known as the emptiness teachings, to put it simply, in Buddhism, right? And when Subhuti sat down in front of everybody to give a discourse on emptiness, on wisdom, you know what he said? Nothing. And after the discourse was done, the Buddha praised him and said, good job, right? You can't talk about wisdom. But I can speak for myself. I got 46 years of ignorance to talk about, right? So focus on the ignorance, and then do that less. And wisdom will, you know, it's really what in Buddhism what they call bodhicitta, which means Buddha nature. And the teaching is that we are all already awakened. You're already enlightened. You're already a Buddha. You don't have to become anything more than you already are. You just have to remove the ignorance. Some of us have more ignorance than others, right? And the metaphor there is like the sun on a cloudy day. When it's cloudy out, you can't see the sun. But the sun is still there. And then when the clouds part, you see the sun. So that sun, that's your Buddha nature. That's your wisdom. That's the beauty of who is there. The ignorance is all the anger and frustration and stories we've built up our whole life that we tell in ourselves over and over and over again. In our head. Does that help? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, normal. Um, I have a question. You can leave that on when you talk. Huh? You can, yeah, there we go. Thanks. Okay. I can hear you. Um, I have a question about meditation when you're paying attention to your breath. Yes. Um, in the back, in, at least in my mind, in the background, there is a, another story. Book. Yes. And, uh, Sometimes if I'm paying attention, my mind is saying, oh, wow, well, I'm paying attention. That makes sense in the mm -hmm. Is there a technique to reduce that kind of thing? Sure. So the question for those who didn't hear it, um, were during meditation, when the effort and attempt is to focus on the breath, and then the story comes up in the back of your mind, and maybe your mind goes to that and you want to come back to the breath, is there a technique? So interesting choice of words, which is common, you said the back of your mind. It's just the mind, right? I want to start with this, right? I get it. Like, so what that kind of infers is that one thinks, you're not the only one, that I'm so focused on my breath and that I just have this tiny little back of my mind thought that arises. But 98% of my focus is on the breath, but there's just one tiny little thought back here, right? So there's another sutra the Buddha taught where he asks his disciple, 
to find and show him where his mind is. I'll save you lots of reading. He never finds it. Okay? So, in that moment that you're focused on that thought, that is your entire mind or your entire no mind, but just for practical sense, that's all of your thought. Because your mind can only focus on one thing at one point in time. Thoughts arise, I'm focused on my breath, and I'm focused on a thought. Thoughts arise, I'm focused on my breath, and I'm focused on my thought. It's not split. So it helps to understand that realistically and truly, we're either focused on our breath or we're focused on a thought. It's not both. So why can't I focus on two things at the same time? Mine can't. That doesn't mean others can't, but my understanding of the Buddhist teachings is that your mind is one thought, one moment at a time, one breath. We might think we're focused on multiple things. Because our minds are such a mess, they're racing like a thousand miles an hour. I mean, I know mine is. So I might think that my mind is focused on 18,000 things at once. But it truly is just going one thought, one thought, one thought, one thought, one thought. It's just going very fast. So the practice is the same thing I've been telling you for, you know, four years. Thought arises. This is what I'm working on. This is for anyone here who hasn't maybe heard me give this example. Thought arises. Breath in, breath out. I'm focused on breath. Breath in, breath out. I'm focused on breath. That's what I want to do. Breath in, breath out. Thought arises. Hunger. Recognize that thought. Release it. Back to breath. Breath in, breath out. Hunger. There's the thought of hunger. Recognize it. Come back to breath. Breath in, breath out. That's what I want to do. I want to recognize the thought as it arises, and I want to gently bring the attention back to the sensation of breath. What I don't want to do, thought arises, hunger. I'm hungry. What I want to eat? I want a burrito. I'm going to go to Pokies. Yes, I want cheese. I want sauce. I want chips. One single thought of hunger, I just sat there for five minutes thinking about a burrito. You know what that means? I'm hungrier now than I was five minutes ago. <laughs> right? So the practice is, first of all, to stop thinking that you're going to shut off your brain. To stop thinking that your mind is going to shut off. To stop thinking that you're going to empty your thoughts. Because you're not. Your entire life, your brain is going to move and you're going to have thoughts. And that's one of my, you know... It's one thing that frustrates me with the way Buddhism is taught, especially in this culture. You know, this, you're never going to think nothing. You end up sitting there telling yourself, think nothing, think nothing, think nothing. And it's like, you're still thinking. Right. Your mind, so the challenge is not to stop the thoughts. The challenge is not to spend seven minutes creating a story from one thought. And why is this practical? You ever been angry about something for five minutes or 15 years? Yeah. <laughs> Right? How long have you been carrying that thing that you've been angry about for 15 years? Probably 20. And it happened 20 years ago. But here you are thinking about it. What we're training the mind to do is to say, and that's why for me what I started today with is gratitude to be alive. Cut the crap story you've been telling yourself for 20 years about what a terrible person you are. Be grateful to be alive, but do not lose sight and recognition uh, and awareness of the tremendous trauma that has occurred for 16 months and still occurs today. That's why I bring all this up. I am grateful to sit here and be alive and practice and focus, but I will not ignore what is going on around us. And we have to be very careful kind of with this you know, you don't put yourself in this little isolated bubble like I'm just going to be this, you know, little Buddhist person living in a closet and, you know, cut out the outside world. There's no wisdom to that. I don't think. Does that help? Yeah. Other thoughts, questions, that or anything, meditation, Buddhist practice, anything you're sitting with? Yeah. Um, so... I find it really easy to um, get into the gap, the space between two thoughts, because 
kind of been meditating for some time now. Yeah. But I know that something that has helped me is sometimes I'll have like a mantra. Do you, does the Buddha teach that? That if you sure. begin to have a thought, then you can gently shift your back into like a mantra? Yeah. So the question for those of you who didn't hear it, but as she said, she's been meditating for a long time. So able to settle in what, what's often referred to or known as a gap in between thoughts. And did the Buddha teach... Uh, and she said that she'll often use mantras or has used mantras or can use mantras. Did the Buddha teach using mantras to kind of bring yourself back? Did I retell that properly? Okay. So um, the first thing is to understand that, uh, just to say this in general, whether the Buddha taught something or not, and this isn't specifically for you or the question, but just for everybody, whether the Buddha taught it or Donald Duck taught it, if it's good and healthy for you, do it. And the reason I start with that is that there is, to me, the very specific teachings from the Buddha on what's called the Anapanasati, the sensation of breath meditation, right? Where when he was he's taught when breathing in, know that you're breathing in. When breathing out, know that you're breathing out. If it's a long breath, be aware of a long breath. If it's a short breath, be aware of a short breath. Like, that was the teaching that I first learned, and that's what I've always stuck with, awareness of breath, right? Now, the beautiful thing about meditation is that if 100 people lead you in meditation, they'll lead you 100 different ways. None of them necessarily right or wrong or good or bad. They're different, right? If somebody leads you in meditation and they tell you, you know, this is the way and the only way, and then they want a bunch of money from you, it's probably time to go somewhere else, right? But be aware that there are so many types of meditation practices. And a mantra practice, having a, a, a something to recite, is a beautiful practice and very beneficial. Right, whether it's Om Mani Padme Hum, right? My first master, someone asked him a similar question, and he said, It doesn't matter if you recite the name of the Buddha or you recite the name of Jesus Christ. What you recite or what you say is not important. You could say Coca Cola over and over and over again. And if using that mantra to keep you focused and present and to stop you from running into the stories, then it's a beautiful practice. Absolutely. So, um, you know, throughout 2,500 years, you have lots of great meditation, Buddhist meditation masters using mantras for practice. Huge, uh, to, Tibetan Buddhism, mantra practice is huge. I mean, all throughout Buddhism, it's a big practice. Um, yeah, so very beneficial. Yeah. What about focusing on um, sensations in your body or sounds in the room? Or is there an advantage to focusing on the breath? What are those yeah. So I'll, I'll close with this question. Um, so the question was, what about uh, focusing on sensations of the body or sounds? Is there a difference in that as there's some focusing on the breath? Yes and no, as up for an answer, right? It, it's, I definitely don't want to share that one focus of something is better than the other because it's not. Right, um, you know, there's a body scan meditation, the, the vipassana practice, awareness of bodily sensations, you know, awareness of the sounds. These are all beautiful Buddhist practices. And so, to say that one is better or more beneficial than the other, really, I, I don't think is true. They're different, right? For me, as a practitioner, I've always used the breath because I don't attach anything to the breath, right? If I focus on, say, you know, I'm going to focus on my legs or my knees, it's like, okay, I focus on my legs. Oh, my leg hurts. <laughs> right. Now I'm going to spend three minutes focusing on my leg hurt. Right? So sounds, guided meditations, listening to music, these are all wonderful things to meditate to. But when you hear sounds and you listen to music, often you're creating stories from that. Right? You hear a sound outside. You hear somebody walk by, and then you start telling a story in your head about where are they going, who was that, why are they so loud, I'm trying to meditate, how dare they interrupt me. You know, there's so many stories. So if using sounds and sensations and things like that can bring you to the present moment and keep you in the present moment, it's a beautiful practice. Um, I often caution people who only do guided meditations that if they're so afraid to sit, and I'm not referring to you, just in general, for everybody, really, if someone is so afraid to sit in silence for five minutes, 
that's a bad sign. Bad sign meaning it helps to learn to be okay to be in silence. Because what are you stuck with your whole life? Yourself. And when you sit in silence, what are you hearing? Yourself. So guided meditation, mantras, are wonderful, beautiful practices. But don't be afraid to also learn to just be with your own crazy thoughts for five minutes a day. Because um, you're going to be stuck with them for quite a while. Does that help? Thank you. Sure. All right, so we're um, just a little after eight. I'm going to join palms and close, and then we'll do a couple quick announcements. And the benefit of this practice be shared with all beings in all directions. May all beings be at peace. May all be free from suffering. May any merit gained be transferred to the four million people and then some who've lost lives in the last 16 months and to their family and friends who suffer at this time. All right, uh, so a few quick announcements, and again, to all the YouTube folks, thanks for joining us. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm a Dharma bum. Uh, we opened up this temple uh, 14, 15 years ago to bring Buddhist teachings to those who show up. Um, so thanks for showing up. Uh, those of us who lead, uh, we're not monks, we're not nuns, we're not gurus, we're not masters, we're not teachers. Uh, we're not looking for students, we're just practitioners. We're people who do our best to understand Buddhist teachings and hopefully put it into terms that make sense to those who show up. Um, each night, uh, we have different practices going on. Uh, things are, that's why I want to say a little more, things are obviously a little bit different now, kind of post, um, you know, we're, now that we're open. Um, we're typically used to having classes every morning, every night, and just about every day. Um, temple's open all day, typically. This is all pre-pandemic stuff, and we'd see six to 800 people a week through here. And we have 80 people sitting in here right now. Um, and we are remaining, um, as I shared on Saturday, uh, well behind the popular view of what's going on out of um, tremendous caution, uh, love, respect, and care for those who have suffered. And um, for us, just out of hopefully some sense of wisdom, at, at least not trying to be too ignorant in thinking that we know what's best. Uh, but we want to do what is and has felt from most people that we have responded to what would be most comfortable for people coming back. And I can tell you most people didn't want to come back here and sit next to 80 people um, in a packed space. Um, so our schedule is different a little bit right now. Um, uh, we have classes now here, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. I lead the this class Tuesday nights. Alex does a loving kindness, a metta meditation, a beautiful guided meditation practice, um, very gentle. Often we'll use uh, to focus on so really wonderful practice. That's Wednesday nights at 7. Uh, and Travis uh, will do uh, what we call Dharma Bone Basics and Meditation. That's Thursdays at 7. Um, also a really beautiful group that explores different meditation practices. And Travis is very well skilled and knowledgeable in the Buddhist teachings. Um, so he'll do that on Thursday. And then I do also Saturday morning as well. Right now, our recovery sangha, which is for 10, 12 years, has been a huge part of our community, those battling addiction. Um, drugs, alcohol, chocolate, whatever your addiction may be. Uh, most of us are addicted to something at some point in our lives. Some of those addictions are more um, devastating than others. Uh, right now, uh, in the temple that's going on downstairs right now, our other meditation hall, we're just meeting Tuesday nights in person. Um, so that is happening downstairs right now. Uh, everything that I didn't talk about is all either virtual only um, or some of them, like right now, they're meeting in person. And they're also um, doing it via Zoom. So some classes we do will be just in person, some will be just virtual, and some will be a mixture of both. How all that plays out over tomorrow, I have no idea. Um, we're adjusting to see how things go. Um, I am, I, uh, thanks to Tom's help who sent it to me, 
I built, set up, created this RSVP system, and I promise you, I hate it more than you do, because um, it's a pain and it has to. It requires a lot of management. So we're going to do away with that as soon as possible. But at the same time, we're also going to make sure that we're mindful of how many people we bring in into the space. Um, let's see. Other than that, uh, outreach programs, um, food distribution, completely on hold. Uh, we are in no rush to bring people together in mass quantities, touching a bunch of food, and sending you all down to the highest uh, uh, unvaccinated population in San Diego, which is the homeless population um, downtown. So as a temple, um, we need to be very careful and mindful and aware of the populations that we are sending volunteers into. And at this point, we're not doing it at all. Um, so we'll stay cautious on, on that front. Um, Buddha for you, the gift shop, again, which also is normally open morning till night. Um, we're just going to have that open Saturdays and Sundays, 12 to 3. And we'll open maybe 30, 45 minutes before class sometimes. Um, you know, so if you need to stock up on your, you know, incense or greatest Buddhist book, um, Dre, we'll, you know, we'll have that, we have that for you um, downstairs. And the other thing I want to touch on is the temple during the day. Um, typically, we open in the morning. Oh, we are doing morning meditation. Monday through Friday, 8 and 8.30. Um, so temple opens at 8 and 8.30. Silent meditation. There's no guidance. There's no instruction. You just come in. You sit down. Someone will hit a bell. You can stay for 25 minutes and go, or you can stay for both sessions. Uh, but then at 9 o'clock, when that's done, the temple will close. So the temple is not open during the day to visit. Quite frankly, we just don't have the resources, nor do we feel comfortable yet having things open all day long for people to just pile into. It's a lot of strain. I promise you, if you think running a, running a temple for 15, for almost 15 years has been simple. Running a virtual temple for the last 15 months has been incredibly difficult. Now opening up a few days ago and trying to run a in-person temple and a virtual temple at the same time is ridiculously impossible. Um, so we humbly ask for your continuous patience as we navigate that process and try to meet the demand of um, every single person, the thousands of people that we try to serve. Um, because trust me, you all want something different. <laughs> so um, we love you all, but we're doing our best. So thank you for your patience. Um, so that's kind of an overview of what's going on. Um, the website will be the best place to observe the schedule of classes, and that'll tell you what's happening when and if you have to RSVP or not. And like I said, I'm hoping pretty quickly that RSVP thing um, can go away and uh, I don't know, maybe we do a first come first serve basis and you can, you know, camp out overnight on the steps or something. <laughs> be like getting, you know, World Series tickets in 1984 or something. Um, so thanks all for being here. Uh, I'm serious about how grateful and, and, and um, thankful I am to have all you back here and to see with everybody, to sit with everyone and see you. Um, it really sucked staring at a screen and talking to myself for the last 15 months. Um, so thanks for being here. Be safe. I wish you well. Um, as always, please just help return the space um, to how it was, which is pretty simple because we don't really want you moving anything right now anyways. Um, so thanks for being here um, and be well. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Oh, I'll, I'll talk to you later. One second. Sorry. Oh, I'm 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 sor